Good morning, and welcome to our COVID-19 briefing on SHIELD, Target, Test, and Tell. I'm Charlie Simpson, Executive Director of Marketing and Communications with the Carl Illinois College of Medicine, and I'm a member of the SHIELD team. I'll be moderating today's discussion. Let's start by introducing our four panelists today. We have with us Chancellor Robert Jones, SHIELD Team Chair and Carl Illinois Associate Dean of Research, Marty Burke, Professor and Director of the Smart Healthy Community Initiative, Bill Sullivan, and Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Innovation and Digital Health at OSF Healthcare System, John Vazinalek. Thank you all for joining us for the third in a series of live stream COVID-19 briefings that we'll be holding this summer. These briefings will be linked to the COVID-19 working teams that have been charged with helping guide university operations throughout the duration of the pandemic. The next one will be on Wednesday, June 24th from 9 to 10 a.m. and will focus on university life. And you'll be able to watch that briefing using this same link that you're using today. All of these briefings will be recorded, closed captioned, and posted to the covid19.illinois.edu website. We'll start with some opening comments by the chancellor, followed by brief presentations by each of our panelists, and then we'll move to asking panelists questions provided with input from members of the campus community. So let's get started with today's COVID-19 briefing on SHIELD, Target, Test, and Tell. Chancellor Jones, would you like to offer some opening thoughts? Yes, uh, thank you, Charlie. And thank you to Marty, Bill, and John for joining me today to talk about the work that you and your SHIELD testing team have been doing to prepare for our return to on-campus operation and hopefully for in-person instruction this fall. And as we have discussed in previous COVID-19 briefings, uh, we believe that the uh, work that we've been embarking upon is absolutely critically important and it has required us to kind of rethink almost every operational aspects of the university. In order to achieve that goal, we've charged an executive steering committee and seven different work teams to lead the comprehensive and very extensive effort uh, to, to planning, to do the planning that's required for us to begin, begin to return to some level of in-person operations this fall and throughout the duration of this pandemic. And so far, we've heard uh, directly uh, from uh, the finance team, as well as the academic team. And next week, you'll be hearing from the university live team. And if you watch the previous briefings, I think you all know that these groups are evaluating, as I said, uh, many aspects, many different possible scenarios, and developing the contingency plans that are necessary to address some of the most likely issues that we will face as a university community. We have charged all of these teams with the enormously difficult challenge in giving us plans in the midst of uncertainty. And, uh, and, and it is very, very uh, tedious work to do. And as I said, it's very comprehensive and they're addressing almost every aspect and trying to uh, uncover and deal with almost every issue and possible scenario. But there's one fundamental certainty that we have laid down from the beginning of our efforts uh, this winter and spring. Uh, the university has an obligation to do all that we can to maximize the safety of all members of our community. We have a commitment to the health and safety of our students, our faculty and our staff. And that was the foundation to any decisions that we will make and all actions that we take. This is a commitment that is also extends to the broader community or a better champagne as well. You know, since we are an anchor in this community and our destinies are inextricably linked. We are working very closely with Urbana and Champaign as we roll out these strategies. Along with a successful uh, transition to uh, the regions uh, into phase four of Governor Pritz Pritzker's Restore uh, Illinois plan, resuming our own campus instruction and operations will be based on our ability to provide adequate COVID-19 testing to our entire community of faculty, staff, and students. And we will only proceed 
if we can couple that access to adequate testing with a comprehensive plan that looks at the vulnerable and aims at mitigating and containing any potential outbreaks. This is the charge that we've given our COVID-19 shield team. And I want to commend all members of that team for their efforts thus far. And I am very, very excited about what has been laid out. And I think today's conversation will help everyone better understand the comprehensive, the scientific basis of these plans that are being created to maximize the safety of everyone in the university campus and in the university community. So uh, Charlie, with that, I'll turn things back over to you uh, so that we can get the conversation started. Thank you, Chancellor Jones. Marty, let's turn it over to you at this time to uh, have you provide an overview of the SHIELD project and the group's recommendation for testing. Great, thank you so much, Charlie, and thank you, Chancellor Jones, uh, for the tremendous opportunity uh, to participate and help lead the SHIELD effort. I'm very excited to have this chance to talk with all of you about the work that's been going on uh, with an extraordinary team of individuals from across all different aspects of our community. Uh, Chancellor Jones empowered us to bring together a remarkable group of students, faculty, staff, partners in the community at the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, as well as physicians and many other community partners charged with the critically important task of teaming up to figure out how we can help enable the reopening of our community as safely as possible. We've accepted this challenge and we have done so with the humble realization that this is an extraordinary task. There's a lot of challenges that we're going to face, but we are emboldened and excited by the recognition that we have an extraordinary community. We're all passionately committed to figuring out how we can as safely as possible reopen our community and educate our students and doing so, of course, with the absolute highest priority focused on safety. So this is why we named this the SHIELD initiative, meant to represent that our absolute top priority is safety. We also recognize that there is no silver bullet in order to try to address this problem. And so one of the key themes that I'm going to highlight today is that we have developed a holistic approach. We have multiple different highly integrated strategic plans that collectively create a whole that is much greater than the sum of its parts. This is meant represented in the idea of target, test, and tell, three key pillars of our overarching strategy that synergize to help create as much as possible, a safe opportunity for our campus to reopen. The third thing I wanna to emphasize today is that we've had the opportunity as a community of scholars to approach this problem in a highly science and data-driven uh, strategy, as well as having recognized that everything that we need in order to achieve the goals that we're aiming for required us to actually innovate. So the I in SHIELD not only represents Illinois, but our extraordinary capacity as a community to innovate and to develop our own capabilities that will allow us to achieve the very important goal that we set out to. And the last thing I wanna emphasize, and I'll close on this for my section at the end, is that we realized we had a very special, unique advantage. And that is the Illinois community has a tremendous level of personal responsibility and commitment to doing their part to make sure this process succeeds. So the I is also meant to represent that I'm committed to doing my part, that I can do this and I can make a difference by participating and doing all the things that I can to take my responsibility to help keep my community safe. So I'll thank you in advance for teaming up with us and doing everything we can to partner on this important initiative. Okay, jumping right in, there is, as I mentioned, three critical parts uh, to the SHIELD platform. We call this target, test and tell. As I'll explain briefly, target is a very exciting approach in which we take a data science, algorithmic strategic plan and put it in place for prioritizing testing guided specifically by exposure risk. 
We also have developed an extraordinary capacity for testing on scale using saliva, which is easy to collect and thereby easy to scale, repeatable and compatible with testing our community many times throughout the fall semester at accessible cost and reproducible rates. We've called this the COVID test with the big eye representing this is a unique innovation that we're really excited to share with all of you today. And finally, the third piece is the tell. It's critical that we are able to participate in very efficient and fast exposure notifications. This is all being done in partnership with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, as well as with a very exciting new Rockwire app that Bill's gonna tell us about later in the talk. And this is again then coupled, as John will describe, to individualized healthcare support in partnership with OSF. So as you can see, we have a highly comprehensive strategy and all these parts work together to overall achieve something that we feel like puts us in a very strong position uh, to do a really important uh, safe reopening of our campus. Okay, so jumping right in, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about each of these components and some of the extraordinary team members who are helping us achieve these goals. And I wanna highlight that many of the key innovations that I'll be able to describe to you today uh, come from the extraordinary Illinois students and postdocs working together with our professors to really tackle these challenging frontier problems and ultimately create a comprehensive strategic plan that benefits from all of that top-notch science and technology. So here I'll introduce you to Jameson Mori, George Wong, and Zach Wiener. These are students in the Smith, Goldenfield, and Masloff labs. Uh, Becky Smith is a leading epidemiologist here on campus. And you may have already heard of Nigel Goldenfield and Sergey Masloff as modeling with the governor as part of the effort in the state to take a very data-driven approach to strategic decision-making. I also wanna highlight that a lot of this work uh, is either already published or is in the process of being moved in that direction. One of the major goals of the SHIELD initiative is maximum transparency and a data-driven approach so that everyone can see behind the curtain and know exactly what we're doing. So in this context, the team has developed a very thoughtful and strategic plan for testing in a way that maximizes the impact on safety. We call this our prioritized testing strategy. Uh, data is uh, collected and generated based on things like how many classes you attend, how many people are in those classes, your housing situation, working situation, other activities, et cetera, helps establish an individualized risk score. And then an algorithm allows us to do random testing that's weighted by that risk score analysis and thereby helping us cover as much of the risk exposure that we need to cover to help protect uh, the campus community in a smart strategic way. We also have a very exciting uh, breakthrough that's happened in the transformation of our veterinary diagnostic laboratory into a human COVID-19 testing facility. There's a great story behind this. Many of you may have heard uh, back in February that a tiger at the Bronx Zoo had been diagnosed with COVID-19. Well, that work was done here at the University of Illinois through our extraordinary veterinary diagnostic lab by Lei Wang, who's a world leader in coronaviruses and literally wrote the book uh, on this topic. So Lei actually then was able to help us team up with the vet diagnostic lab, as well as professors Tim Fan and Paul Hergenrother, who are on the SHIELD team. Uh, you may have heard previously about the remarkable work that Paul and Tim have done in taking cancer therapies originally developed for treatment of animals and then translating those for the treatment of humans. This is the Pets to People initiative at the Institute for Genomic Biology. And so here we recognize an extraordinary chance to go from tigers to people. So we'll call that a new innovation on the Pets to People front. Uh, and the Vet Diagnostic Lab has now been transformed into a world-class human COVID-19 testing facility uh, building on this theme. We also recognize that there was need for innovation on the testing front. Now, very fortunately, there's been tremendous amount of progress as many of you may have heard, uh, particularly recently a breakthrough showing that saliva is actually sometimes more sensitive for detection of COVID-19 than even the nasopharyngeal swabs. And this paper that had came out uh, actually in uh, April uh, showed with a really a strong data set that you can detect COVID-19 in saliva with remarkable levels of sensitivity. This was a huge breakthrough and suggested you could perhaps do this on scale through saliva, which would be much easier and much more practical. There was, however, still limitations with respect to the actual logistics and operations of those tests and some of the technical challenges that precluded scaling. So we had the chance to put together an extraordinary team of students and postdocs. These are from the Hergenrother fan, Brooke, 
Bashir in my labs. Uh, these are some extraordinary people that have been working uh, nonstop to develop this test. Uh, Diana Renoa, Fadi Anaji, Robin Holland, Kelsey Green, and Ariki Valeri. And this has actually been an extraordinary uh, effort that has led to a really fantastic result that we can now utilize here at the University of Illinois. So the standard method, as you may have heard, uses an NP swab followed by RNA purification and then RT-PCR. This has challenges in terms of the amount of work that needs to be done and the supply chain bottlenecks that make it difficult to scale. As I mentioned, there were recent reports that you could use saliva, but there were still supply chain bottlenecks that actually precluded this in a scalable fashion. So there was a vision articulated from this team that perhaps we could go directly from saliva to this RT-PCR test and thereby get rid of those supply chain bottlenecks and achieve something that could be scalable. And so to make a long story short, I'm very excited to share with you that this team has succeeded and they've created a new COVID test that directly goes from saliva to PCR. It has levels of detection that rival even the very best tests that are out there. And this was achieved through an extraordinary effort in which a wide matrix of different uh, temperatures, times, and buffers were tested to find conditions that allowed this to be directly uh, achieved. And so this is now a new test that we can use on our campus to allow us in a scalable fashion, up to 10,000 tests per day are gonna be capable uh, through the new VetMed uh, lab facility. Uh, Dr. Preeti Sharma in Dave Cran's lab also has uh, developed an antibody test based on a report that uh, came out of Mount Sinai on April 15th. Again, like the saliva, this has now been approved by the FDA for use. And uh, Preeti was able to reproduce this test and optimize it, uh, allowing us to also do antibody testing okay, at the vet med facility, in this case on a more targeted basis uh, with its strategic use being driven by its maximum impact. The last thing I can mention to you is that we've again, taken a very data-driven approach to the decision-making around SHIELD. And there's very strong data showing that exposure notifications, whether it's through uh, person-based contact tracing, as well as digital apps for exposure notifications, if you bring those two things together, you get much more effectiveness in terms of mitigating disease spread. And so we are taking a hybrid approach. Uh, Bill will tell you a lot more about the Rockwire app. Uh, with respect to the person-based contact tracing, we've formed a very strategic partnership with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District every step of the way, working together to figure out how to do this in a maximally effective manner. Uh, and this has been a tremendous partnership. We're looking forward to continuing into the semester and throughout the year. And then last, uh, John will tell you a little bit about uh, all the efforts that have been done in partnership with OSF Healthcare to provide outstanding healthcare for individuals who do test positive or need to be isolated or quarantined there, so to make sure that everybody is taken care of so everybody can do their part, participate, and still have the full campus experience uh, available to them. Okay, uh, just to close, I'll just wanna end where I mentioned that I would in that the I stands for individual responsibility. So we have an extraordinary team that has put together an extraordinary platform to empower and enable our campus to reopen as safely as possible. In order for this to succeed, it's absolutely critical that everybody does their part. That includes getting tested, participating in the exposure and status notification, and all the simple stuff. Wear your mask, stay six feet apart as much as you can, and wash your hands. And if we all do our part and participate in these activities, we are very hopeful that we have a chance to re-engage in the extraordinary campus community that we all know and love and can do so as safely as possible. Thank you so much, Charlie, back to you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, that was a great overview of how testing will work um, and segues nicely to Bill and John's presentation on exposure notifications and the care and support of individuals who test positive. So Bill, uh, why don't you take it away and share your screen? And Bill, you want to come off mute. Thank you, Charlie. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry for that delay. 
Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to uh, chat with you a little bit about um, the work that we're doing uh, with the Illinois app. Some of you know a little bit about the Illinois app and others are learning about it for the, for the first time here. Uh, the Illinois app is built on the Rockwire open source platform, which we've developed and built here at the University of Illinois. Uh, we deployed the, the Illinois app for the first time in October of 2019, last fall. And we had an update in uh, February of uh, 2020, and we're we've got uh, we've got a new version at the uh, app stores uh, right now. The um, the Illinois app and Rock the Rockwire platform and the Illinois app are led by the University of Illinois. And in August, we're going to open up our software uh, so that it's available to the world and the world can can uh, participate in contributing to the to the software to serve people and communities and campuses around the world. In developing the uh, platform and the Illinois app, we've worked with a whole range of professionals from all across campus for the last 22 months. Uh, our colleagues in technology services have been key. Uh, our our uh, partners at the uh, NCSA have been outstanding and wonderful. We've, we've had deep involvement from student affairs with really significant participation. <laughs> from folks from Housing and, and McKinley. Each of the colleges has uh, been at the table with us to discuss their priorities. And we've met with dozens and dozens of faculty members who've um, contributed ideas uh, as well. We, I, I wanna give a special shout out to the Siebel Center for Design and the Center for Social and Behavioral Sciences for their key work in helping us understand that not only what we have to create is um, needs to function very efficiently and effectively from a technological standpoint, but it's gotta be acceptable to typical human beings who are, are not necessarily uh, excited about the technology in, in order to be uh, effective. We've engaged with students like, uh, in this case, uh, Sanjay Patel's uh, Alchemy program uh, to help build capabilities and ca capacities into the app. And we've had experts from a range of health and wellness issues on campus participate with us continuously. Uh, a whole variety of us have given a, a, a quite a growing number of presentations in the past months about what we're building and why we're building it. Uh, this uh, picture was taken before we had the shutdown. Uh, and we've learned a great deal from the feedback that we've gotten while we listen to our campus colleagues uh, tell us what they like and what they're challenged by and what they're really quite frankly nervous about. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about what we've heard and what we've learned from these engagements. And the, the first and most important thing concerns privacy. Privacy comes up every single time we make a presentation and one of the, one of the challenging issues here is this notion that big brother uh, or maybe big chancellor might be watching. And uh, people, people are concerned that, gosh, an app like this that has such powerful capacities might be um, sharing information about me to the government or the chancellor in a way that I'm, that I'm not comfortable with. Is the, is the chancellor gonna know that I'm in my office or I'm not in my office? Or um, the wealth of data collected by this system um, is gonna make it really challenging to resist the urge to sell my data. Um, the financial pressures of the time mean that maybe we'll get rid of the foundation and we'll just sell our students' data uh, and, and make hundreds of millions of dollars uh, all the time. Uh, so th those are concerns. Uh, another set of consistent concerns that we hear about is a question of equity and access. Not everybody's got a cell phone or a smartphone. Not everybody's got data capacity on their cell phone plan. Um, and various groups of people are more or less comfortable with using apps. So students, for instance, are much more comfortable. In fact, they, they live in this mobile environment that's their habitat in large part, but um, older folks are less, are much less likely. And there's differences in races uh, as well. Um, African-American folks are significantly uh, less likely to say they feel comfortable with uh, anything that smells of surveillance or tracking. Um, so we have to be, uh, well, we've hear, we heard this and uh, we've, we've built the app with these concerns in mind. Also, we've heard consistently, nobody wants to be tracked. Nobody wants a little chip in the back of their neck. They also don't want their phone um, reporting uh, out where their, where their locations are. And there's real concerns about data security. How in the world are you gonna keep my data secure? 
and there's a recognition uh, that that uh, that an app alone is not enough. I mean, it's not enough to keep me safe or keep my classmates or my colleagues safe uh, through the use of an app. And finally, there's a real question about speed. And this we've heard from our colleagues at um, HD, the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District and our uh, colleagues in epidemiology and modeling. It, is that the faster that we engage people, the faster we get them information about their testing status and about their next steps, the better we're gonna be able to control outbreaks, the better, the faster we're gonna be able to reduce hot spots and super spreader events. Let me give you a little bit of an overview of the COVID-19 capabilities in the app and see if I can address some of the concerns that have been raised in the previous slide. Now, as we learned from Marty a few minutes ago, Testing and limiting exposure are, are key to slowing the spread of COVID-19. So our efforts are part of this comprehensive effort that Marty mentioned on campus that involves a great deal more than our app alone. And Dr. Vilsenluk, uh, who's gonna talk in just a minute after me, is uh, gonna show you some of the richness of the human touch that's, that's associated with that. So we've taken a privacy first approach and have innovated a great deal around privacy in the development of the platform and the app. Uh, one of our great innovations is the privacy slider. Uh, those of you who have seen the app have experienced this. The slider presents um, a revolutionary approach to engaging uh, users with privacy. Instead of uh, yes, no, in or out, up or down, you, you agree to my standards or you don't get to use my app, uh, we're, we're uh, giving a five levels of um, choice here. And at each level of choice, we provide you with, uh, oops, we provide you with a description of the features that are enabled at that privacy level and a, a description of the data that we, that we store for each of those levels. I'll be happy to answer more questions about that later if you'd like. So we're taking a revolutionary approach to privacy. First of all, users own their data. We never, never sell it or give it away. We're not Facebook, we're not Google, we're not a private sector entity that, look, that seeks to monetize your data in order to, um, in order to make a profit. We're the University of Illinois, and we're gonna use the data to enhance health and safety and functioning on campus. Consent is critical. We provide multiple opportunities for consent. We enable lots of choice, and we give the users control over the use of their data, the storage of their data, and when they wanna delete it. We have robust security built into the app. We follow industry best standards and best practices in data security to minimize risks to your personal data uh, through, through data loss or through data misuse or unauthorized access to your data or unauthorized disclosures and alterations of data. We, we also meet the uh, standards of a variety of laws that uh, are designed to protect data. So the European standard GDPR that you may have heard of, we meet all the standards for GDPR. We meet the California Consumer Protection Act standards, and we meet the Personal Information Privacy Act standards of the state of Illinois. We've integrated, uh, part of the innovation here is that we've integrated with healthcare providers. Uh, the app allows users to opt in and connect with their healthcare provider to retrieve any test results that they've got from their COVID-19 tests. Uh, we've done this uh, in two ways. With McKinley, we've built a uh, seamless process in that uh, users can consent to having their test results uh, automatically downloaded. As soon as, you know, within 15 minutes of McKinley getting the test results, the, they'll be pushed to your phone. We've also integrated with um, uh, the Epic Healthcare, uh, uh, the electronic management system uh, that OSF and others use, 70% uh, of the healthcare providers in um, the state use Epic. And you can, uh, in this case, you'll have to, you'll have to go out to, to the Epic uh, sites like MyChart and request that your information be downloaded. The point I wanna make about this is that these test results are encrypted. They're encrypted um, 
in rest, in storage, in the, uh, in the cloud, and they're encrypted in transit. And they're only decrypted when they get to your phone. And that's where they live. They live on your phone. So it's really a very secure system. We provide uh, opportunity for users to upload their own results. So if you've had a result, uh, we've, been, we've been talking to CVS. CVS is interested in getting into this uh, testing uh, game and we're not integrated with them yet. If they do, if you get a test at uh, CVS, you can simply take a picture of it, describe a little bit about the test and upload the image. And that image then will go to uh, Champaign-Urbana Public Health District and they will decide whether it's a verified uh, test result or not. We've also got the CDC approved list of symptoms and you can self-report symptoms if you want. This is important because reporting symptoms helps us provide you up to the minute um, uh, recommendations on next steps for preserving your health. Um, users can opt in if they want to uh, engage in our exposure notification service. We built our service using uh, Bluetooth Low Energy and it's uh, completely compatible with the Apple Google uh, process that's uh, been released. And if you have an Apple or Google phone, it's already in the phone. Um, how we do this is we identify how long and uh, how close you are to other phones as a way to measure uh, the duration of your contacts and the, and the um, extent to which you've had exposure to other folks. This we're gonna employ in combination with the human contact, uh, contact uh, tracing that's typically done We've got really innovative ways. Uh, Sanjay Patel, Professor Sanjay Patel has developed a really lovely way to um, protect data and do this in an anonymous fashion that we feel really is, uh, is quite uh, brilliant. And um, the process of doing human touch contact tracing and digital exposure tracing really is gonna, we, we believe will result in a healthier campus. We've also got a, uh, a a COVID status display in the app. Um, it characterizes each individual based on their recent testing um, results as either green, uh, which indicates they're safe, uh, yellow, which most of us are probably right now, means we, there's no evidence of uh, antibodies and no evidence of active virus. That, that they might be likely infected would be orange and uh, red would be infected. I'm happy to answer questions about that uh, later as well. We provide people in the app um, uh, a set of um, next steps to maintain their health and improve their health. And these next steps are described and dictated by the county that they're in. So it will, will be, uh, ours will be through uh, Champaign uh, Urbana Public Health District. Uh, we make recommendations uh, based on what they suggest. Uh, and these are tailored to the latest test results and exposure notification and self-reported symptoms. Uh, we're piloting the app in uh, June, uh, and we've got participation from uh, the athletes and DIA and the College of Vet Med and uh, Carl Illinois College of Medicine. Well, not, not, not the athletes in the College of Med and the athletes in the, in the College of Med, but um, uh, interns at, the, at, at Vet Med and students in the, in, in, uh, in the College of Medicine. Uh, we'll be doing a richer, more comprehensive pilot uh, in, uh, in July, that's our, our second round. This can be led by Brent Roberts from the Center for Social and Behavioral Sciences and Rachel Switsky from the Siebel Center for Design. Uh, Brent and his group are going to do systematic interviews uh, uh, and explorations with 300 students, 300 essential workers, 300 faculty members, and 300 controls. And Rachel's folks are gonna do deep dives uh, in, with eight to 10 students and some essential workers and faculty members. And I've expressed to them my concern that we go back to the concerns that we heard uh, from the presentations we've made about equity and access and vulnerability and make sure that vulnerable students and faculty uh, are engaged in uh, helping us understand how they use the app and what the barriers are so that we can tweak those things before students come back to campus. So here's the app again. It's uh, available in the, it'll be available in the app store. The next version will be available in the, in the app store, we believe, this week. It's uh, under expedited review uh, with Apple right now. And with that, I'll turn it over. I'll turn it back to, uh, well, I guess I'll turn it to John. So let me stop my screen here. Very good. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share the, some of the work 
that is a continuation of the very strong partnerships that we have uh, with the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I am uh, an OSF healthcare employee. I'm the chief medical officer for innovation and digital health. Um, I'm an emergency medicine physician and I have been going back for more than 20 years. Uh, there, my connection to the University of Illinois uh, more formally began about eight years ago. We share innovation funds and we build things together uh, with the strength of the University of Illinois. And I serve as a clinical professor in engineering uh, as well as with the College of Medicine in Chicago and with the Carl Illinois College of Medicine in Urbana, leading the jump simulation laboratory there. That, I say this just to give you some perspective uh, about the connection between these two anchor institutions which lead health and development of innovation for health for Central Illinois. And I believe you can see on the screen, one of the programs that we were called upon to produce when the COVID crisis hit uh, Illinois in particular, uh, we converted our efforts to uh, lift up the service that we would require, leveraging digital technologies across Illinois. And we're um, remarked upon by the governor of the state as a leader uh, in the provision of digital health to provide assurance and treatment for those who are undergoing uh, COVID as a crisis individually and for their families. OSF has long endeavored to produce uh, excellence in terms of compassion and competence. And this brief uh, diagram, which you can see on this screen, shows you the reach of the state-funded pandemic health worker program offered through the Department of Healthcare and Family Services in cooperation with the state of Illinois and the governor's office. Uh, the color coding here represents uh, areas of COVID affected individuals who are currently under monitoring and under treatment uh, by our pandemic health work program. This uh, program began in the early phases of Illinois' response. Uh, we developed uh, the program and then it was formally funded by the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services on April the 1st. We began clinical service providing a digital layer and a human being connecting with individuals who are suffering from COVID um, on a digital platform and in a layered way, which brought us to a massive scale, an ability to serve the communities across central Illinois. What our service entails is clinical expertise. That is a layered approach involving trained individuals who escalate to triage nurses, who escalate to providers and physicians who have access to the wealth of resources through not just OSF Healthcare, but through the wealth of resources for community health and in partner organizations across the state. We have um, been able to develop this program in partnership with the state as an imperative to provide a scalable solution. And when the issue of bringing campus up online came to pass, we realized that the campus required some competent, compassionate and capable partner to provide service at a massive scale. 51,500 students may uh, be able to return shortly to campus. If that uh, population of students were concerned, had fears, needed guidance, wanted additional help, not just from an application, but also from a helping hand from a human being, that would have to be a scalable solution. And we modified the state program to particularly serve the needs of the campus in Urbana and to provide those services through a digital automation and a digital connection as a first very broad layer, through a human digital connection, through telehealth services, and then layered clinical services that go all the way through the accessing of specialists. We even, in cases where illness uh, does occur, can help to facilitate admission to the hospital or emergency services as needed. And that goes well beyond, again, OSF. It goes with, to all the partners and members of our community. So we have an appropriate um, disposition for patients who need additional service. This program has been up and running and serving thousands of individuals uh, across the state since April 1st and has been widely lauded as a great source of comfort and service for the people of Illinois and now is a great uh, source of comfort and service for the 
students and faculty and staff and community of Urbana in a unique way as we move forward in this partnership uh, with the Urbana community. In the current state, uh, our contract with the state of Illinois provides free of charge to clients uh, access to a massive capacity to serve. And currently we serve, as I mentioned before, pods across central Illinois, as you can see in greater depiction on this map, in uh, regions which are expansible to a total of 12 pods across uh, the state of Illinois. In the north, uh, Advocate Health, and in the south, SIU have partnered to provide coverage over those areas, which are depicted here in blue on the diagram that you can see on my screen. You can imagine what a daunting proposition it was to provide this type of service uniformly and at high quality for, the, for this great region across the state of Illinois. And that required these layered approaches that you see depicted in the bottom row. The digital connection brings a scale. And the way this works for us and will work for you is that uh, students, faculty, staff, and members of our community can opt in to a digital connection which checks in on daily or more than daily basis and receives information that are, that are uh, provided by uh, individuals to keep them connected to a trusted health source. And if anything in the reporting of data that comes through a text message is out of whack or concerning, or even if the individual had a particular question, there is a connection back to a contact center that is staffed properly with expertise and is, has an ability to escalate uh, the services that are required. Our healthcare workers in the current state actually physically go to individuals' homes and provide technology across central Illinois. We train them using simulation and standardized patients so that they are, they build rapport so that they have excellent uh, uh, bedside manner, as it were, through the digital interface and provide uh, a supporting function to bring even our most vulnerable populations, technologies that they would not otherwise have access to so that they can keep connected to us through the health worker service. These are human beings who are supporting other human beings. And that's the fundamental service that medicine provides uh, today. Our clinical service expands well beyond the digital health worker program, involves specialists uh, that uh, range from pulmonary critical care through pediatrics, and when it's necessary, can even admit patients to a remote patient monitoring solution that keep patients connected digitally continuously so that we can keep in touch with them and their vital signs to ensure rapid recovery. I wanted to pick up just a, a theme from uh, Professor Sullivan's commentary. Because I'm uh, in the healthcare field, I have particular sensitivities to privacy issues to the HIPAA regulations and other regulations that are absolutely cornerstone to the physician-patient uh, relationship and the privacies that are required through those relationships. I can assure you that these privacies are in place. No data is passed. In fact, when we convert data from EPIC into this, it is only at the student's request. This is not a bi-directional transfer of data. This is a singular, your data, if you wanna share a test result, will pass into uh, this program so that we can keep connected to you appropriately. And in the current state, this is only an opt-in function. Students, faculty, staff, and community members will have the ability to select these services. And if they do not want them, that is okay. Uh, we'll still be there. Uh, so it's always available. The way it works for us, we, we tried to answer the critical problem. So uh, work in innovation. So we're always looking for the, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What is the critical question we're trying to answer? The critical question here was, hey, you notified me. Thank you, Professor Sullivan. Thank you, Rockwire. I have an exposure. I need to do something. I was trying to answer, what do I do next? We've connected with the McKinley Health Service. We've connected with the public health service. We've connected with our teams individually, and we have begun the path, and we're well along the way, to create an integrated solution that students can opt into, that keep them connected, keep them connected to their important healthcare services, provide nursing and physician expertise, pandemic health worker program if necessary, and keep them connected through um, uh, this type of digital um, notification. The first starts with the status change, 
The second is an opt-in function that a student, faculty, or staff, or community member asks for service, and we keep connected uh, through the phone and through other technologies if necessary to escalate care. If someone does become ill, we have a particular program that carries them through their 16-day convalescence from the COVID virus and keeps them connected in a way that shares their vital sign data only with the healthcare enterprise and it keeps it private and protected by those HIPAA regulations. And if in the rare, and it has been thankfully more, uh, less common uh, than we had initially um, prepared ourselves for in this pandemic, to admit patients to the hospital, we have expanded our service through remote patient monitoring to provide devices that can measure blood oxygen level, blood pressure, heart rate, and other things that can be delivered directly to the client and to keep them connected with providers continuously so that if there is a, um, a need for escalation because of a, a degrading healthcare condition, if shortness of breath becomes overwhelming, if oxygen level drops, we are immediately responding. And these tools are uh, leveraging machine learning and other algorithmic approaches that give us early warning, even before the clinician may uh, recognize the problem, creates the alert and we connect back to the patient directly through this remote patient monitoring solution that we call Acute COVID at Home. The Pandemic Health Worker Program and Acute COVID at Home are all services that have been offered free of charge for every resident of the state of Illinois through the Department of Healthcare and Family Services. This is not a pitch to bring patients into OSF. This is OSF providing service as it was requested to provide for the state of Illinois. Urbana is our trusted partner and a partner that we have worked diligently with, with the Jump Arches program to fund testing, to fund te technology solutions such as advanced analytics and machine learning. We have been a long partner and it is our calling to provide this type of service to the campus and its community when it gets ready to stand back up. Now, uh, as of June 8th, you've heard about the application. We will begin a communication to those members to let them know about these services in a meaningful way. And I'll tell you, I'm 50 years old and uh, I know that things are a bit different than it was when I was a kid. We have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Twitter, and we have, gosh, I don't really know all the different social media channels we'll be leveraging. We're gonna leverage them to make sure that people are aware and remain connected to us and understand the services that we're providing. To provide a specific service for this campus and this community, to provide reassurance, to mitigate anxieties and concerns, and probably most importantly, to provide the service that would be required clinically should it become necessary. We will also, as has been mentioned a few times, help the student understand that they are a member of a broad community that has behavioral expectations. What are the rules of the road when it comes to returning to campus, getting food, going out? How does that even work? We're gonna be there to help to provide immediate answers for questions that might, be, that might come up just because uh, COVID has created such a devastating change to the way our community functions. And that is uh, my particular portion of the presentation. I'll turn it back over to Charlie, I believe. Thank you, Bill and John. Appreciate the excellent overview. Um, with the remaining time, let's jump right into questions. If you could close your screen, please. Thank you. Um, so the process is I'll direct a question to one of you, but you can all jump in if you've got something to add. And I wanted to start with the chancellor. Um, why is it important for all students, faculty and staff to participate in prevention and wellness efforts? Well, Charlie, it's, it's important because, uh, you know, as we have said, uh, the, we believe very strongly that returning to face-to-face -to -face campus operation is absolutely uh, critically important, uh, but that has to be done in a way uh, with the safety of our students at the forefront of every decision. And uh, we have created the conditions for a safe return to campus operation. I think we see that the uh, SHIELD team and the six other working groups really have uh, really have worked very hard to provide uh, excellent progress in our ability to return to 
face-to-face -face operation in a safe way. Um, creating and maintaining the safe environment for our faculty, staff, and students, we need everyone, everyone to participate in uh, healthy and safe behaviors, such as social distancing, wearing masks, and washing your hands. But we also need everyone to be tested, to use the app to help us mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And as has been said many, many times in this presentation today, your privacy and your data will be secure. So as was said, we're all in this together and this will work best if we all make a commitment uh, to keep ourselves safe and to have at the front of our mind the safety of others. We provided the innovation to allow this to work appropriately, and now it's up to the individuals to take responsibility for themselves and for each other. So this is why it's absolutely important to every member of our community and the expanded community uh, to continue to promote a safe environment and participate fully. We expect um, as close to 100% participation in downloading the app and participating in testing as humanly possible. And this is very, very uh, critically important to what we're trying to do to come back to face-to-face -to -face instruction in the fall. Thank you, Chancellor Jones. Marty, I wanna bring it back to you to talk a little bit more about how testing will work. So the plan, as I understand it, is to test and retest all students, faculty, and staff upon the return to campus. How will this work logistically? You know, how many testing locations, where will they be? How much capacity do we have to do those tests uh, day in and day out? Great, thanks, Charlie. So we imagine really as kind of two phases to the you know, concept of testing everyone. The first, of course, is we really need to get everyone re-entered into the community as safely as possible. And so what we're imagining, uh, a lot of these logistics are still being uh, developed, but in July, there will be an opportunity for faculty and staff to be able to get tested. So we can get our you know, baseline and make sure that those who are still currently here, uh, you know, we, can, we can get them tested and it'll happen twice. So the data shows that to really feel confident that you're negative, uh, you need to be tested and then about three or four days later, get tested again. Okay, so this is uh, what we're planning on in July and get as many people, faculty and staff uh, tested as possible. And again, remember, you just need to submit a saliva sample. Okay, so it makes it as simple uh, and easy as possible to do it. Uh, then when the students, uh, the majority of the students return, and as mentioned, we're talking about more than 51,500 students, uh, you know, coming into our community again, uh, we imagine this will be just part of their orientation. So uh, you get your housing information, your dining card, your iCard, you also submit uh, your saliva sample uh, just as part of that standard uh, re-entry into the, into the community. And again, with the saliva-based testing, this actually becomes very practical uh, and easy to do. Uh, and so uh, I think that's gonna be a really good way for us to get everyone uh, re-engaged. The next key phase, however, is then gonna be throughout the, the semester and throughout the year, uh, as mentioned, the idea here is to do very smart uh, randomized testing to allow us to make sure that we, we keep a, an understanding of where there may be uh, you know, COVID-19 popping up. And so uh, for this, we're gonna have about 20 testing stations all throughout the campus. You'll see them soon, uh, big tents, as well as some of them uh, uh, local, uh, localized internally. And the idea is so that just on your way to class or your way to work, you just pop in, you can submit your saliva sample and then go on your, your day. And through the app, you will receive notification that it's your turn uh, to go ahead and get your test uh, and to allow yourself to participate fully uh, in the rest of the campus life. So this we hope will be a very practical and easy way for people to participate. And again, I can't stress enough how important it is for us all to do our part uh, to make sure we can stay safe. Thank you, Marty. Just a quick follow up for you. So. Um, you're excited about what the saliva um, testing um, shows and, and the data that's coming out. We're making a big bet on this. This is brand new technology. Nobody else is doing this um, the way that we propose doing it. Tell me about your confidence in the data so far and the, and the, and the pilot testing we're doing. Um, and do we have what we need at this point to go ahead with the green light on that? Okay, great. So uh, first, very fortunately, uh, there have been other studies from other groups, uh, increasingly so, uh, showing that saliva 
uh, is a very good way to test for COVID-19. In fact, as I mentioned, uh, there are studies showing that it's actually more sensitive than the nasopharyngeal swab uh, in some cases. So we feel very confident based on this data uh, that saliva is in fact a really good way for us to, uh, to go. It's been approved by the FDA as mentioned. And so uh, we're on a very strong foundation. It's also worth mentioning that the primary mode of transmission is thought to be through saliva. So this gives us a chance to test the medium that is the primary responsible for the for the transmission. So really make sure that we're understanding whether people have uh, COVID-19 in their saliva samples, I think is really important. In addition, now that we have this test optimized and developed, uh, as, as mentioned, we're doing pilot studies uh, with different groups across campus, as well as in partnership uh, with CAR. We're working together to do another one with OSF uh, and, and others throughout the community to get more and more data to allow us to feel very confident. Uh, currently, we're comparing directly the nasopharyngeal swab to saliva-based testing in the same individuals. And the data is very encouraging, showing that we have very good levels of sensitivity and detection capabilities, giving us more and more confidence that this is gonna be a great way for us to go. Great, thank you. Um, wanted to shift it over to Bill and John uh, for test notifications. So other than the infected individual, who else will get notified and what data will be shared? Bill, you're on mute. Only the infected individual will get uh, notified. The, the, uh, the, the notification comes directly from the healthcare provider to the individual's phone. It's encrypted uh, in transit and decrypted on their phone. Uh, we do not have that information. That information is not stored in the cloud uh, uh, for us. Um, it's, um, no, it, it, it's the individual and we won't share it. So the yeah. app will provide direction on what they should, instructions on what they should do next. And it's their responsibility to follow up on that. That's right, that's right. Okay. John. John, did yeah, you have a comment? And just the, the, the function that we want to emphasize here that uh, we're providing is as the, as the student, faculty, or staff, or community members notified that the notification then may be a call to action and that there are clear and plain guidance uh, available on the app on how to connect next. And that guidance could actually be uh, tailored to whether it's a student or a community member, varying times of day, in all cases, uh, OSF stands up as a member of our community and has the availability through the, our 1-800 number and through other clinical services. That, that service is already in place. Uh, so uh, we are connecting students properly to those types of services because they may not be aware of them. Thank you. Hey, Charlie, that, Charlie yeah. when, I say, when I say that uh, the app won't no, notify anybody, um, it's important to recognize that when the test, the testing the place where the test gets analyzed uh, is required by state of Illinois to share the test results with the, with the public health in the state of Illinois. So while we won't, the app won't be sharing that information, that information does go, uh, if we do the analysis uh, as we expect to on campus, then that, that information will be shared with, the public, with public health. Thank you for the clarification. And Bill, staying with you, um, you, you know, you talked about the Rockwire app's design for confidential contact tracing only. Um, you've done a good job of underscoring the commitment to privacy and how that works. Um, are there plans though to add geolocation tracking? So uh, I, know, I know that we have the capability to add that, but is there a plan to add that in the future and, and when would we do such a thing? Well, we're, we've talked about this, uh, but boy, it, it touches a really hot button with the uh, members of our community and and a lot of people are not interested in that so if we did it we would do it as an opt-in uh, opportunity only and um, the idea would be it would be incredibly useful in terms of identifying hot spots or super spreader events and um, we're I'm having a meeting uh, my next meeting at noon is to talk about how to do this in an anonymous fashion so we're not sharing any individualized data um, uh, in order to protect privacy but to gain some of that uh, useful information. And Bill, I know we've talked about adding manual or human contact tracing to supplement the digital contact tracing. Do we know how that's going to work yet or uh, um, operationally? Well, uh, there's uh, the CUPHD has 30 some people that are engaged in uh, kind of old fashioned boots in the ground contact tracing. We're 
uh, with Marty's efforts and McKinley's efforts, we're going to put five people, uh, five FTEs on our campus to do campus related uh, boots in the ground contact tracing. And um, I also understand that we're going to have a surge capacity so we can bring in a bunch of people. Um, Brent Roberts in the Center for uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences has, is training, I don't know, 18 or 20 young people who are on campus this semester to, uh, to engage in this process. And so we'll have, we'll have five FTEs at McKinley and we'll have the surge capacity as well. So it's, it'll be a very nice combination of both um, digital and human touch uh, contact tracing. Great, thank you. Um, Marty, just uh, you talked a little bit about the safety measures in place um, and the importance of that. Do um, what measures are actually going to be in place that you can talk about at this time for students, faculty, and staff, um, such as a requirement to wear mask or limit in-person gatherings to 50 people, um, the, the providing PPE, setting up sanitizing stations? Like uh, I'm assuming all those are part of the the safety net that we're trying to provide. Can you talk about that or build on that at all? Great. So, yeah, so fortunately, the chancellor has set up seven separate teams, uh, of which we are one of them. And uh, all of these issues are being comprehensively and very thoughtfully approached okay, by our partner teams. Uh, and I think with the uh, rollout of these uh, information sessions, we'll hear a lot more about the specifics around each of those. Uh, but I take uh, great uh, comfort in knowing that there's such a comprehensive and Kind of interconnected approach to dealing with all these challenging issues. You know, as we mentioned, as excited as we are about the innovation and the new technologies that we're going to be able to bring to, you know, help the community be as safe as possible as we open through the SHIELD effort, we do understand and recognize that it's the individual choices that we're all going to make that are ultimately going to be the most important as to how well we can protect our community. So, uh, you know, Charlie, as some of the things you mentioned, everyone wearing their mask, staying six feet apart, washing your hands, avoiding large gatherings per recommendations, right, through the CDC uh, guidance, which will continue to evolve uh, as we go throughout this whole process. These are absolutely critical and everybody has a chance to do their part. And if we do, and this is why I'm so optimistic, you know, we're an amazing community who is so committed to doing this the right way. And we have such a, an extraordinary level, I think, of individual responsibility. We all wanna reopen and we all wanna do it safely. So I think these are gonna be the critical issues that we all have to commit to. And I feel very optimistic that in concert with the initiatives we presented today, that this will allow us to actually have that best opportunity to reopen safely. Thank you, Marty. And we are a couple of minutes past the top of the hour. So I think we're gonna conclude there. Um, and I wanna turn it over to the chancellor uh, for any final comments. Can you unmute, please, Dr. Jones? Thank you. Sorry about that. I kind of lost my screen there for a moment. Uh, let me just end by saying, first of all, uh, thanks to Charlie, the entire SHIELD team for taking time out to take really, in a very short period of time, a deep dive perspective and briefing our community on the importance and the innovation uh, that this university is bringing to bear on the fundamental issues of testing and uh, making sure we have the ability to uh, notify people regarding their COVID-19 status and that they have a uh, connection for digital engagement with the healthcare system to get the healthcare and assistance and advice they need. And I can tell you, it's gratifying for me as chancellor of this university from day one, uh, even as we decided to go from face-to-face -to, -face to remote education, we've done nothing but innovate. Uh, we've innovated in a ways that has helped the state make decisions that save thousands of lives. And now as we prepare to do the fundamental work that we know is important to do, to return to face-to-face -face instruction, again, innovation, has been at the forefront of the work. And I am extremely proud of the work that this SHIELD team has done. And I can tell you, it is the envy of a lot of my colleagues in the AAU. I'll be participating in a call on Saturday where many of them are, have been asking and asking for questions and asking for information about the innovation 
that our faculty, our staff, our partners like OSF and Carl and others have really brought to bear on this issue and returning to campus operations safely in a way that is driven by innovation that is unlike any that I've seen across the rest of higher education. So you can imagine that makes me extremely proud to be the chancellor of this amazing university. So thank you all for participating. I certainly hope that you receive great benefit from the briefing that we provided for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor. And thank you to all of our panelists, Marty, Bill, and John for joining this briefing event. And once again, our next briefing will be Wednesday, June 24th from nine to 10 a.m. And the topic will be university life. And you'll be able to watch that briefing using the same link you're using right now. And all these briefings will be recorded and posted to the covid19.illinois.edu website. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great day.